morning, everyone. Uh, we are officially streaming and recording this meeting, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, welcome everyone to the February 23rd meeting of the Voter Assistance Advisory Committee here at the Campaign Finance Board. Uh, my name is Amanda Melillo and I'm the Deputy Director of Public Affairs at the Campaign Finance Board. I use she, her pronouns. I'm a white woman in my 30s with long dark blonde hair, uh, brown eyes, and I currently have a teal Zoom background with a little speech bubble in a darker blue. Um, thank you so much for attending this meeting tonight. Before we get started, I'm just going to give a very brief overview of the accessibility features that we'll be using. Um, first off, for anyone who's speaking, we'll be asking everyone to announce their name and provide a very brief audio description of themselves before they speak the way I just did. So for example, you can introduce yourself with your name and then just provide a very brief visual description of what you look like or the environment that you're in or something that can give people a sense of how to picture you when you are talking. Um, you have, may have noticed that this meeting has closed captioning. Uh, you can access closed captioning by clicking the three dots at the bottom of your screen and selecting show subtitle or show transcript. Uh, we are also going to make the live transcript available with the video after this meeting for anyone who wants to catch up afterwards. Uh, you may have also noticed that we have ASL interpreters with us today and one of our staff members will be ensuring the ASL interpreters video is pinned to the screen at all times. Um, one last housekeeping note, um, you know, we will be monitoring the chat, but for anyone who has a question for one of our panelists or for the VAC members, uh, please put that into the Q&A box. I'll be monitoring the Q&A for questions and we're going to be using the chat more for troubleshooting and sharing information and things like that. Uh, so at this point, I would like to turn it over to our VAC chair, Zoila Torres, for his opening remarks. Um, Zoilo, are you in the panelist list? I think he got... Did he get booted? Booted, yeah, um, but okay. is not in the attendee list either, so... Yes. All right. While we were waiting for him, Amy, I'm going to turn to our executive director, Amy Lopress, for her opening remarks, and we will see if we can get our back chair back. Okay. Um, well, uh, good evening, everyone. I am Amy Lopress. I'm the executive director of the Campaign Finance Board. Uh, I am a middle-aged woman. I use she, her pronouns. I am uh, white and I have I am bald but wearing a black headscarf and a purple cable knit sweater um, and a dark lipstick and my background is blurred so you, all you can see is the yellow walls of my office. Um, good evening everyone and I'm just going to give you a uh, brief uh, update on what's been going on at the Campaign Finance Board. Uh, January 15th was the most recent filing deadline for uh, campaign candidates uh, who were running for city office. Uh, we received 471 disclosure statements that were filed across seven election cycles. Uh, we have also been collecting uh, disclosure statements from the transition and inaugural entities created by uh, approximately 50 candidates who won municipal office this fall. Our auditing staff is beginning the post-election audit process for the 2021 elections, and that is you know, starting with some requests for documents from candidates and will uh, audit all of the activity uh, and make ensure that the public funds that were paid out during the 2021 election were paid out appropriately and were spent appropriately and that the law and rules were followed by all candidates and that will proceed over the next couple of years. Um, and that is my uh, <laughs> my report. Uh, I don't know if you need me to stall to, uh, if we've gotten Zolo in yet or not. <laughs> Everyone who knows me knows I can talk forever, so you know, <laughs> all I get. Thank you, Amy. <laughs> um, 
At this point, I will turn it to any of the members of the VAC who would like to uh, provide any opening remarks. And we will see if we get Zoilo back. If not, I think I can sort of go over what he was going to say in his remarks. Is he back? Yeah. He is, he is not back okay. yet. Was that you, uh, Jamila? It was, but I think Mazeda was going to say something. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, we are in uh, same pace. Uh, my name is Mizada Udin. I am a brown colored Bangladeshi woman, and I represent uh, South Asian community. And this is my first priority. And moreover, I am representing highest English proficiency community. And uh, we are very proud. We are, uh, we are promoting ourselves. We are engaged ourselves and we will be educate ourselves continuously what we started from the beginning. Thank you. Thank you, Mazeda. Uh, Jamila, I'd love to turn to you now for what you would like to say. Hi, good evening, everyone. I'm Jamila Rose. I'm the Deputy Public Advocate of Civic and Community Empowerment at the office of the New York City Public Advocate. I'm trying to slow down for an um, ASL. And um, we're really excited about municipal voting. Oh, let me give my description. I am a black woman. Right now I have curly hair and I'm sitting in a room with white walls and my guitar is behind me. And I have on a shirt that is white and brown plaid with a black insert. Um, yes. So we're really excited about municipal voting at our office. And we're looking forward to working with the Campaign Finance Board and many of the other city agencies, such as Moya, the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs, as well as um, the New York City Civic Engagement Commission and all other entities to make sure that municipal voting can um, be implemented and we're looking forward to that process. So just wanted to say that on behalf of the public advocate and um, looking forward to hearing the presentations from our guests tonight. Thank you. I'll go ahead and go Amanda unless you want Zoilo to chime in as chair since he's back. Uh, no, no, go right ahead. Um, okay. All right. I, you know, what I have to say, I think everybody already knows. So go we're, right ahead. We're, we're waiting to hear your, your, uh, your, your words of wisdom, Zylo. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm Christopher Malone. Uh, I am a middle-aged white male. I have graying and brown hair. I have uh, clear rim glasses. I'm wearing a dark gray plaid suit with a gray, light gray, red. I'm kind of colorblind, so sometimes I don't know what color the, 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 the things I'm wearing is. Uh, I'm in my office at Farmingdale State College, uh, a campus of the State University of New York. I'm the associate provost here. So behind me is a conference table and on the walls are something I'm very proud of, are posters from the Apartheid Museum in South Africa, where I was fortunate to bring students in a past life that uh, I cherish greatly. Uh, I was, I, I call myself a COVID uh, a member of the VAC committee because I was appointed in April of 2020. Uh, so I'm coming up on my two year anniversary and it's been quite a ride uh, as we all know in municipal elections. But uh, with tonight, uh, the next chapter is being written and, and like Jamela, I'm really excited to hear about um, the presentation. So thank you. Great. Uh, Zoila, we're happy to yeah. turn to you for your opening remarks. We saved maybe the best for last to frame the entire thing. Well, you know, I, the, my opening remarks are basically, um, I mean, center around what, I, what everybody already knows. The main theme of this uh, meeting is, um, uh, you know, regarding the uh, the new uh, uh, voter law that was uh, um uh, that it's still in the books, uh, and you know, although it's being contended, it's still um, uh, a, a, an issue that we have to organize around. 
Um, so I, I think that if we can just move quickly into uh, the the subject matter, I know we have some presentations that are um, going to be made, and and that is really the uh, the next point on the agenda. Um, and uh, I'm. Uh, would like to, um, Amanda, if you can give us some direction as to um, uh, how to proceed, because according to my agenda, the uh, uh, next presentation is uh, by the Center for Secure and Modern Elections. Um, is that how we are proceeding, Amanda? Yes, uh, that is how we're proceeding. Uh, first, we're going to hear from Neil Ubriani, the Policy and Research Director at the Center for Secure and Modern Elections. Uh, he will talk about implementation questions and issues for New York City to consider as we implement the new municipal voter law. Um, so I know Ali is promoting him to panelists right now, and we're looking forward to hearing from him. Okay, great. So uh, can we proceed? Yes, I think it takes just a minute for people to join as panelists. I'm, I'm here, Amanda. All right, perfect. Hi, everyone. Away, I'm, Neil. I'm Neil Briani. Um, I use he, him pronouns. Uh, I'm the Policy and Research Director at uh, the Center for Secure and Modern Elections. Uh, I am an Indian American man. I'm about 35 years old. Uh, I'm wearing glasses. Uh, I have a shaved head, and I'm wearing a, a flannel, flannel button-down shirt. Um, I'm in a, a bedroom in an Airbnb in Arizona. Um, just uh, hello to all of you in New York. Uh, <laughs> I, um, I work for the Center for Secure and Modern Elections. We're an organization that works on voter registration modernization policy, uh, mostly at the state level. Um, we work on things like improving uh, the quality of voter lists, uh, same voter registration, automatic voter registration, and just sort of thinking about how uh, technology can be used to improve the voter registration experience for everyone. Uh, I had done a, a call with Amanda and the folks from Moya to sort of learn more about the, the municipal voting uh, uh, law in New York. And, and we just had a very a thoughtful discussion and she invited me to come talk about sort of the questions that we had uh, during that meeting, things to think about potentially during implementation. And so um, I think the, the big thing that we discussed is sort of, uh, you know, we, at CSME, we spent a lot of time thinking about list maintenance. Um, when people move, how do we make sure that their voter registration follows them um, to their new address? And, you know, that's sort of a, an interesting question in municipal voting because a lot of uh, that work happens at the state level. Sort of uh, people are in the statewide voter registration database. And when they move, uh, how can their voter registration follow them in that statewide voter registration database? And so we wanted to ask a question about sort of how municipal voters um, one, will they be included in the statewide voter registration database for New York, um, or will they be contained in sort of a separate database uh, that is separate from the statewide database? Um, and that has both pluses and minuses for both of those. Um, for the statewide database, you can sort of easily track when somebody moves within New York City. That's an easy way to update them without them having to sort of provide all of their information again. Uh, if somebody naturalizes, for example, they can just stay in the statewide database they just take the M off of their name and they become sort of a voter who's eligible to vote in all elections. Um, it also carries uh, some risks if somebody is in the statewide voter registration database as a municipal voter. So for example, if somebody's a municipal voter who lives in Queens um, and then they move to Nassau County, um, does that municipal voter designation follow them to Nassau County and Nassau County knows at that point, this person should not be sent to ballot um, or should not be on the rolls in Nassau County. So that's the sort of an important question to consider. I know that the law talks about changes of address within New York City, uh, but I didn't see anything specifically in the law about changes of address outside of New York City. So that may be an important question to ask about how people are processed um, when they move outside of New York City. And I think this gets to sort of the larger question of are people included in the statewide, municipal voters included in the statewide voter registration database, or will there be some sort of separate uh, database that includes those voters that's distinct from the statewide database. Um, I think the other questions to ask are um, other list maintenance questions, you know, when people die, um, how are they uh, removed from the list? You know, for example, uh, that those kinds of death removals happen uh, in the statewide database 
are those provisions going to be carried over uh, just sort of jot for jot to uh, municipal voters? I think it may make sense, but I just want to sort of raise that question, sort of say, you know, are the same procedures for uh, reports of death from uh, the Department of uh, Health carried over, uh, are those going to apply to, to uh, municipal voters? Uh, death reports from the Social Security Death Index, things like that, thinking about those sources that are used for regular list maintenance, and should that apply, um, you know, 100%, uh, you know, mostly with some modifications to uh, municipal voters. Um, so one other question to ask is, you know, New York has uh, disenfranchisement for people who are convicted of felonies who are currently serving a uh, sentence of imprisonment. Um, you know, how does that work for municipal voters? Just sort of general overarching list maintenance questions and how do they apply to this new category of municipal voters? Um, I think uh, another question I have is uh, the law is written right now for people who have a, uh, who are either legal permanent residents or have a work authorization. Some people who have a work authorization will lose that work authorized status um, at some point. And so I'm, I guess my question is, is there a provision in the law for people who, uh, you know, whose work authorization expires? And so, for example, I, I register as a municipal voter uh, in a period when I have uh, work authorization. If that work authorization expires and I continue to be on the rolls to protect me, from sort of being registered in a way that I am no longer legally eligible to be registered, is there a way to remove me from the rolls uh, because I have lost my ability to register under the municipal uh, voter law? Um, I don't know what the procedure for that is. Is there a way to sort of uh, identify people who have lost their work authorization and are no longer eligible under this law? But that may be an interesting question to consider to make sure that nobody is unintentionally remains on the rolls after the period in which they're eligible to be registered. Because if a person remains on the rolls in a period in which they're no longer eligible to be registered, that may have immigration law consequences for them. Because, you know, sort of the question is, when a person tries to naturalize is, you know, uh, were you registered in a state, local, or federal election? And then when you say yes, there's sort of a question of like, were you legally registered? I mean, this may not be a question because if somebody overstays their work authorization, they may have bigger problems than sort of registering um, in, a, in a local election, but it's a question that I wanted to raise uh, for folks to consider. Um, I think the other question I had um, was about sort of allowing people to update their, their, their municipal registrations when they move. You know, we talked about sort of uh, people uh, having their registration updated based on, you know, change of address information received from the Postal Service. But if somebody wants to affirmatively update their registration, it looks like they can't go on the online voter registration website. The online voter registration portal is not accessible to people who are municipal registrants. So is the, is the only way to update an existing registration to complete a new registration form, um, or is there some sort of simpler way for people to update the registration rather than sort of going through that process again of completing a form? Somebody says, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm an existing registrant. Um, I would like to just say, you know, I want to stay on the rolls. I've just moved from 79th Street to 86th Street. Is there a way to, to make sure that I stay on the rolls without having to go through the process of submitting an entirely new paper form? Um, I think those are the, the major uh, questions that we had. You know, this is a really exciting, uh, you know, initiative. I think it's, it's, it's as a native New Yorker, I'm, I'm proud to say that like New York City is, is, the, is the city that's trying this. Um, just as we hope that we can, you know, these questions about list maintenance can be useful because list maintenance is a big part of voter registration. Once people are registered, that's not the end of the story. Um, it's making sure that, you know, their registration continues to follow them when they move um, and that uh, when people die or people move out of state, um, their registration is, uh, you know, uh, it, 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 it is removed to sort of reflect their status. Um, so, I'm, I'm hopeful that these questions can sort of uh, invite more questions and, and we can be useful in this dialogue. But uh, I want to thank you all for, for inviting us and for allowing us to be uh, participate in this process. Great, great. I, I, uh, I got cut off a little while ago and I'm not sure um, it, uh, if um, Amy, the press had given her remarks. Did uh, Amy, did you 
uh, deliver your remarks? Yes, I did. We used the oh, time okay. while we were trying to get you back to uh, um, to give my remarks and to have re opening remarks from other uh, committee members. Okay, great, great. Thank so then, you. great. No, I did. I got a little disoriented there once I got cut off and came back on. Um, I guess that the, the the next person. Um, and the agenda is Jesse Carpenter. Do we have him? Um, uh, I do just want to interrupt Zoilo. We heard, we heard from Jesse today that uh, they would not be available. Um, okay. But I do think while we have Neil here, because we are waiting for the next panelist to log on, um, okay. we, we certainly have a lot of time if, uh, you know, back committee members have questions. I see, Chris, you have your hand up. So I would certainly encourage you to ask questions. Thank you, Amanda. Hi, Neil. How okay, are you? Great. Chris, Chris Malone. Um, um, you, you talked about the M designation. In reality, is this, uh, are we talking about two separate lists where the municipal list is separate from the state list, or is it a subset of the state BOE list, number one? And my second question, you talked about moving, but it, how does that, you know, list, uh, keeping it straight, um, apply when you, you have state elections versus the municipal elections? You know, let's say for sake of argument, a municipal voter wanders into a polling site uh, for assembly or state senate. Um, what, what, what does it look like at the, the point of contact where that person's not on the list? So I, I am just reading the law, you know, we work on, on state voting policy. This is our first, like, I think we're learning about municipal voting just the same as you all are. Just from reading the law, it seems like that M designation is the, and I don't, for, I guess I should go back. I don't know the answer to the question about sort of, is it two separate databases? Is it a subset of the statewide database? Is it a database that exists only at the city level? I think that's an important question to ask, and I think that's why we're raising it. Um, on sort of the M designation, just from reading the law, the M designation is sort of the sorting mechanism to determine if a person is eligible to receive a full ballot or a municipal only ballot. Um, and so that person in the poll book will have an M next to their name that will make that determination. Um, and the law is written so that there's, there can't be a separate M line. So you can't say, you know, if you are a municipal voter, go to this line. Um, everyone has to go to the same line and the poll worker makes the determination of which ballot um, the person receives. And, and Amanda and Amy, you should correct me if I'm wrong because I am just an outside observer here and, and you all are the, the experts here. Yes, but everything you're saying is correct about what is in the law. I just have a, a quick question for you, Neil. Um, is, I guess, you know, I mean, you raise you know, all the right questions about voter, about list maintenance. I mean, these are all gonna be important um, areas for the Board of Elections to figure out as they're administering this new law. I was just wondering, you know, based on your experience and uh, do you have any suggestions for best practices for what is the best way to handle, you know, the natural, Death registry, the postage, I, I can never remember the name of that postage system that, that uh, changes your address. Um, but, you know, do you have any suggestions on what the best way to handle that is? I, I would say, and, and I, I have not sort of, I say, yeah, I would say yes, uh, but this isn't sort of my final answer. I, my instinct is to create a separate database here um, and not put it in the statewide database because I think the risk of error of putting this in the statewide database is potentially catastrophic. Um, you have that risk of somebody who moves from Queens to Nassau. Nassau County doesn't know what the M means or there's no M column in Nassau County's version. Um, that person is, you know, th that person is, is now registered to vote in Nassau County without that M designation. That's the kind of thing that talking to immigration lawyers, I think kind of, makes their hair stand up. Um, I'm open to sort of hearing what others have to say, but that's just my initial instinct. And then in terms of that M database of people who uh, are you know, clearly municipal, I think you could do a lot of the existing NBRA list maintenance 
uh, that's required. You could use postal service NCOA data to identify people who've moved within the city. Um, you could use uh, death data. I think that like the NBRA wouldn't apply to this because the NBRA only applies to federal elections, but I think it provides a useful set of procedures to conduct this type of list maintenance. So to identify people who have died, to identify people who have moved, to identify people who have gone, who are incarcerated and no longer eligible. Thank you. And I mean, we'll look forward to, I mean, it's, there's a long time, luckily, for implementation. And so we may be back, you know, talking with you about, um, you know, implementation issues. Yes, I imagine that's the case. Um, do any other VAC members have questions? Um, I also want to remind everyone who's watching, if you have a question and you want to put it in the Q&A box, um, that's also another way to ask a question to Neil. The only questions I've seen so far are making sure that all of this material will be available after the meeting. So I get the sense that people are going to want to digest this and reflect on these questions. Um, so just assuring everyone, in case you didn't see the Q&A answers, uh, the video and transcripts will be available and we will send out follow-up materials as well. And, right. and if I could just add one thing, I, I should add that the people who do this in other jurisdictions, Tacoma Park, um, other jurisdictions in Maryland are probably the best bet to answer these questions. Like these are, you know, sort of just reading the law and, and having an interesting conversation with Amanda. These are the questions that we had, um, but those people are the, the experts in, in sort of on the ground implementation. And they may have different answers to these questions based on practical experience. Neil, I think you provided the perfect segue to our next speaker actually. Um, so I'm really happy to say that we are joined by Laura Reams, who is the city clerk and director at the Department of Communications and Legislative Services in Hyattsville, Maryland. Um, as background, Hyattsville, Maryland is one of the jurisdictions in Maryland that has implemented a similar municipal voting law to what we are looking at implementing here. Um, and the electorate for their local elections has also been expanded to include permanent residents. Um, so we're really looking forward to hearing about her experience implementing this and asking some questions as well. So Laura, welcome, and we look forward to hearing what you have to say. Well, thank you very much. I'm so pleased and so excited to be here tonight to speak to all of you. Um, a little bit of uh, background description on me. I am in my 40s. I am a white woman. I have uh, brown hair and bangs. I'm sitting in a room with midnight blue walls. And behind me over my shoulder is one of my favorite posters that says, I love Hyattsville, so I vote. And that was actually a poster that we created and gave away to voters last year in a partnership that we have with the Maryland Institute College of Art. Um, so I would love to share with you, hopefully I have sharing privileges, um, just a really brief presentation, and then I would be happy to answer any questions um, that there are. So I'm here tonight to talk to you about non-citizen voting in Maryland, specifically the city of Hyattsville. Um, so I've already introduced myself. Um, my pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, again, I'm the city clerk for the city of Hyattsville. I'm also the director of communications and legislative services. That's me on a good hair day. Um, so about Hyattsville, we are a mid-sized city. We're located outside of Washington, D.C. We serve about 21,000 residents um, and we serve four services. So what does that mean? That means police, uh, trash, um, community services, including youth and senior programming, uh, code compliance, all of those things. Um, we are a council manager form of government. So we have a mayor and 10 council members. We are the second largest city council in the state of Maryland next to the city of Baltimore, although we're not anywhere near their size. Um, we are a culturally diverse and inclusive community and pride ourselves on being so. Um, we have a very strong um, immigrant population in our community. In fact, um, approximately 40% of our community's population is Latinx. Um, and we have a lot of native Spanish speakers. Um, regarding our elections, our elections are nonpartisan. They are held every two years, except for when we have special elections, which I had one this last September, September and I'm actually going into one in June, so they can be more frequent. 
a couple of things about City of Hyattsville elections. Um, of course, we're here tonight talking about non-citizen voting. We also allow 16 and 17 year olds to vote in the City of Hyattsville. Um, so some background regarding non-citizen voting in the city of Hyattsville. This was authorized by our city council and implemented in 2017. The city maintains its own city only voter roll that um, what Neil was talking about was extremely interesting to me um, because we thought about all of those things, of course. Um, our voter roll is separate from the state and county roster. We have a 30 day residency requirement and we don't ask any questions on citizenship and we do not maintain any citizenship data. Um, the city of Hyattsville is a sanctuary city and again, no questions asked. So a lot of times I get asked questions about, you know, how many non-citizens you have registered in the city of Hyattsville? And the answer is, I don't know because we don't ask. Um, individuals who are not eligible to vote at the state level can register in a city only role. And, you know, that may include individuals who just do not want to register at the state level. I had one voter who told me, oh, there's no way I'm getting put on a list for jury duty. And so that's why they ended up registering at the city level. Um, our voter roll is available under the Maryland Public Information Act. Um, however, we only release it to qualified individuals and who are qualified individuals. So those are our candidates or an authorized person working for one of our candidates specifically related to voter outreach for our municipal elections. Um, another common question that I get asked um, regarding city only voters who may be pursuing their US citizenship, um, the city will provide a Mahan request a letter that provides background information on city of Hyattsville voting laws and clarify that that individual is voting lawfully in our municipal only elections. So what does the voter turnout look like for us? Um, so this graph that we have here breaks it down by city only and then that's in the dark blue and then city and county combined in the purple. So what we have seen since we implemented non-citizen voting is that our city only voters turn out at a much higher rate than our combined voters. And so you can see here um, in 2017, so this was the year that we implemented non-citizen voting, we had 39% of those who were registered on the city only list come out to vote versus 15% of our general overall voting population. And as an election administration uh, administrator, I love seeing this graph because you see it increasing over the years. And in our last general election last year, um, we did a vote by mail election. So we had 67% of our city only voters come out and vote versus 28%, which was still pretty respectable for municipal elections um, of our total voter population. So for me, I, you know, I always hope that that speaks to our efforts in terms of sustained outreach to our community regarding this. Um, just to talk through a little bit about what we've done on voter outreach, I'm sure there's some amazing lessons that we could use, learn from New York on voter outreach. These are not some things that we have done um, in our community that have worked. Um, so embracing and utilizing your trusted sources. Unfortunately, government is not always a trusted source. So it's important to form partners, um, find your key organizations that can really reach your population and folks feel comfortable speaking with them. Um, another big thing that we talked about or we learned throughout this process was having strategies for starting conversations with voters. Um, so it does not work to have a voter registration table that just says simply registered vote because some individuals just, just say, well, there's, I'm not, there's no way I'm eligible and we'll just walk right on by. So creating different ways and having strategies to reach the voters, I think is really important. Um, along with that, being direct, you know, addressing concerns and any potential fears up front. Um, we've done that in a variety of mediums. We've done that through print media, flyers. We've done that by having Instagram live questionnaires. Um, it's, it's been something that we've tried to be very upfront with with our community. And then of course, you know, emphasizing the good sides, emphasizing the benefits of having, you know, a voice in your community, um, increasing civic engagement. Uh, it has obviously been really important for us, particularly in COVID times to diversify our communication outreach mediums. Um, we have always had a fluent native speaker review all of our materials for accuracy and clarity. This was probably even more important to us in 2021 when we were doing an all vote by mail election for the first time. So I'm sure you're familiar, there are a lot of pieces, a lot of paperwork. 
So it was really important for us to have um, fluent native speakers review that paperwork, make sure that we had the translations correct, make sure that we had everything that was as clear and easy to understand as possible. So we actually, we partnered with the Center for Civic Design on doing some test uh, groups, test focus groups to look over different materials. And it's kind of a no brainer, but you know, I think it is important to kind of keep in mind that confusing materials are a barrier. We are all really busy on a day-to-day -day basis. And then if I'm looking at a form or a flyer or voter registration application, and I can't quite figure out how to fill it out, I'm gonna put it down and maybe go on to the next thing. So that is obviously not what we want. So we wanna make sure we're reaching our voters um, as clearly as we possibly can. Um, it's incredibly important in Hyattsville for us to have uh, bilingual print and social media campaigns. I'm sure in New York, um, there's a lot of other languages. So multilingual campaigns are very important. And in, la in our election last year, we did our very first um, Spanish language voter education video. So we included a how to vote tutorial. And as I mentioned earlier, we did some Instagram live events that were very successful for us in terms of getting information out to voters. Um, in Hyattsville, you know, I'm really passionate about elections. My team is amazing. We're all really passionate about elections. And so we try to use creative advertising to make it fun. Um, you know, you give me a stencil and a can of spray paint and I will be out there like painting the sidewalks telling you to go vote. Um, we try to take advantage of opportunities and have polling places um, where we have a carnival when we were in non-COVID time. So we would have early voting at the carnival and just take advantage of things and, you know, really celebrate civic engagement and celebrate democracy in our community, make it easy for folks, make it convenient for folks and make it fun. A um, couple other things sort of along the way. Oh, there I am. I'm popping up. <laughs> I'll explain that in a minute. Um, so a couple other things along that same line. Um, so going to the voters, um, making sure that we go to where people are, again, making it convenient for folks. So we are at grocery stores, we're at schools, we're at shopping areas, we're at transportation hubs, we're at food distributions, parks, playgrounds, sports fields, schedules, events. Give us an event and my team will show up and we'll be doing voter registration or just generally talking about elections. Um, so one of the things that there's this is a funny video of me popping up, this is from 2019. Um, we did pop up polling centers. So that is literally just us taking a tent out, having poll books that were running off a battery, being out there for about, I think it was between two to four hours and actually having it as a polling location. So we were out at our metro center. So we were catching individuals as they were leaving for work in the morning. And then we were actually back later in the evening and catching individuals as they were coming home and they were able to actually vote in our municipal elections in a really easy and seamless way that worked with their lifestyle. Um, so touching on kind of what I said earlier about seeing uh, voter turnout and seeing gains over the years, you know, I think that really speaks to how successful outreach is sustained. So it should really be a part of your culture. Um, in Hyattsville, it's not just election season. You know, we talk about voting during non-election season times and really work hard to ingrain it in our culture. Um, some of the other things that we've done um, relate to, you know, making sure that our welcome packet for new residents includes information on voting, um, getting that information to realtors, getting that to rental license applications, all those types of things. Uh, branding obviously counts. I mean, I don't think that anyone does branding better than New York City, so I don't think I could teach you much there, but we have found success um, in terms of having e easily recognizable branding for elections to create consistency and promote awareness throughout our community. Um, one thing is the lesson learned for me um, over the last years is it's important to inform your candidates, um, make sure that they're aware of the different rules and regulations, um, whatever your laws are for the handling of voter registration applications. Um, so I have on here, make allies, not adversaries. Um, you know, we had some issues, you know, when we first started about candidates not understanding the different rules for handling voter registration applications that were completed. So we've tried to address that by having candidate information sessions and candidate training. So we're really upfront with what the rules are and create a dialogue and make it comfortable for our candidates to come to us and ask us questions. Um, finally, I don't know if the city of New York has same day voter registration. We implemented that back in 2019. Um, 
And this is just another lesson learned. So making sure you have multilingual support and signage um, on, on the day of election to support voter registration same day. That is something that we have found that our voters love and really have taken advantage of. So finally, I'll just close out and, you know, I just want to share this was something that was shared on social media um, after one of our elections. This is one of our residents um, who was able to participate in their local elections for the first time as a result of the law that was adopted by the city of Hyattsville. And, you know, every election has a story. And so, you know, as somebody that works in elections, these stories, these positive impacts in our community, um, they really mean a lot. And, you know, I think that as you work towards implementation of um, non-citizen voting in New York, you know, looking for these stories, again, these trusted sources and sharing these stories throughout the community to kind of share what the impact of the law is on your residents. I think that's very powerful. Um, so with that, this is my contact information. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions and I'm really appreciate uh, you guys asking me to be here tonight. So thank you. Thank you so much, Laura. Um, I'd like to open it to the VAC committee members before I turn to the Q&A. So do any of the VAC members have questions for Laura? Uh, I'd love to ask, oh, go ahead, Danielle. Sorry, I see your hand up the old fashioned way. Yeah, the old fashioned way because I have a new computer and I can't make it go. Um, I just wanted to say thank you so much for all the work you're doing because it's just, I mean, as we move forward with this and the, 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 the work that we need to do here, it's just great to be able to turn to folks like you and, and um, you know, the VAC staff is just wonderful to have reached out to people who can, can talk to us about this um, because it's a it's a wonderful innovation here, and so it's great to be able to rely on your experience. And I, so I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you. Hi, Laura. I, the, one of the charts you showed was the distinction between the city um, elections and county, and because New York City, we our five boroughs are part of our our counties, but they're part of the municipal process. What 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 was that showing? I mean, it sound, it looked like the non-citizen voting had pushed voter turnout up very high, but I, I want to make sure I, I know what I was looking at. Sure. Yeah, I'll speak to that. Um, so what that chart was showing, and actually I could pull it up real quick so we could look at it. Um, one sec. So it is showing, um, this is just for the municipal election. Um, so it breaks out, so the city of high school maintains its own city only voter roll. So what we see here, for example, back in 2017, the 39% that it's showing for voter turnout, that is just specifically looking at our city only voters who came out and voted in our 2017 municipal election. Now, the purple that you see on here is our city only voters combined with the much larger voter roll that is maintained by the city or Prince George's County, which we reside in, um, what that larger overall voter turnout percentage is. Um, so it's just kind of comparing, you know, what we see as the, the total voter turnout that we have for the city of Hyattsville and then narrowing that focus in and just looking for the city only voters out of those who registered with the city of Hyattsville how many of them showed up to vote. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, it does. Uh, just quick, quickly to follow up, do you have data on the voter turnout just for non-citizens, the, the percentage versus uh, the overall population registered or unregistered? So we don't, we, again, we don't collect any citizenship data. So, you know, the, what we have there showing as a city only, um, that is any individuals who either are not eligible to vote at the state and county level. So that would include non-citizens. And it would also include any individuals who just did not want for whatever reason to register at those levels. So, you know, I wouldn't want to speculate on how many of those city only voters are non-citizens, but you know, that is the population that is included in there. Thank you. I have a hey. question. Oh, oh, sorry, Zoila, go ahead. Yeah, very quickly. How, how do you identify the non-citizen voter registrant? I mean, do you actually, um, you know, 
describe the non-citizen as a non-citizen registrant? Or do you describe them as a municipal registrant? Uh, what is the term they use to describe the registry? So we call it a city only voter registry. And, you know, again, we don't collect any citizenship data. So it is just our city of Hyattsville only municipal registry. I see. Okay. That was my question. We were actually just having this debate on the staff side because there's a lot of discussion right now about what we should term these voters because there's a lot of debate currently. Um, I know there's talk of municipal voters, but we don't think that's necessarily a word people use every day. Uh, I know Amy has a question. I see Neil has his hand up, so I want to turn to him after Amy as well. I just have a question about this voter turnout data. And so I, I guess if could you give us, I mean, and it doesn't have to be exact numbers, but sort of a sense of the number of people who are registered as municipal voters for Hyattsville and people who are Hyattsville residents who are included in that larger, you know, registration. Like what is the kind of ratio of those two groups? Sure, yeah. Um, so our city only voter registry is quite small compared to our larger registry that comes from the state. Um, so I don't have the precise numbers off the top of my head, but I think we're somewhere around like 300 city only voters. So again, it is a small population, although we've seen increases with every single election. Um, as far as our county slash state registered voters, we have about 11,500. Thank you. Um, I had a question in the, well, a couple related questions in the chat. Um, first of all, in Hyattsville, do you have elections where people might vote on county, state, or federal races at the same time that they're voting in city races? We do not. Um, that's been something that we've talked about um, for a long time, um, just because there, there was some thought that if we were able to combine our municipal elections with those county level or state level races, it may um, positively impact our turnout, although there's, you know, of course, other complications. Um, in our particular jurisdiction, our county has 27 municipalities, and they just can't support um, their elections and handling support of municipal elections on the same day. So it's not, it hasn't been a possibility for us to even move forward with that. So at this time, none of the city of Hyattsville elections interlap or overlap with any county or state level elections or federal elections. Thank you so much. Neil, I know you have a question, so I wanna make sure to turn to you. I, I just had a question about the registration form that people use for um, municipal elections. Um, it is essentially the same registration form just without a uh, attestation of citizenship as part of the form? It's similar. Um... It is similar. I, I like to think it's a little bit easier to use um, because again, we've worked hard to make our forms, you know, as clear and easy to use as possible. That's not a knock on the state of Maryland form at all. <laughs> um, uh, but it, it, so it is similar. And again, it doesn't, you know, of course there is no citizenship question on it. Do people still provide a driver's license number or last four of social on the form? Um, they do sometimes, um, but we accept all other kinds of, um, to different documentation to provide proof of residency. So it could be um, a utility bill. It could be a school ID. So on the back of our voter registration application, we have a list which is not exhaustive of the different types of documentation that we'll accept. And I've seen many different types. And if somebody provides a driver's license number or last four social, do you do the same check? that you would do for somebody who provide, who, who's using sort of the, the federal or, or state registration form? Um, the, their process at the federal or state level is different than our process. So it's at the municipal level, I'm not looking into any kind of statewide voter database or anything like that. Um, they do have to sign an affidavit at the bottom of the application that attests to the, the, um, the accuracy of the information that they've provided. Um, and we do, have a voter registration, you know, verify that information, they have a photo ID, is it the person that's filling out the application? Got it, thanks. Great. 
All right. Um, I see that Terrence, who is an attendee, also has a question. So Terrence, I would love for you to ask uh, whatever your question is. Ali is going to take you off of mute. I'm sorry. Thank you. I wanted to know how did you, uh, how much outreach did you do to the immigrant community who's disabled or your disabled outreach in total with this form? Thank you. That's a great question. So I don't think that we've distinguished between our outreach to the immigrant community, Greater Hyattsville, and the disabled. We haven't gotten that kind of granular in terms of our specific outreach strategy. However, we do um, work with different organizations in the community that do work with disabled persons. And, you know, we work with them so they can help us get that information out. Okay. I think we've addressed the questions that were in Q&A and I think I've gotten to everyone that had their hand raised. So I'm gonna have a sort of last call for any questions for Laura while she's here. All right, this is a really fabulous and informative presentation. Um, I think it leads in very nicely to like what I am going to talk about that we're thinking about and we've been looking to cities like yours and how you've implemented this uh, just for best practices on what we might do here. So thank you so much for appearing tonight, Laura. I'm sure we'll have follow-up questions for you. Um, and we really thank enjoyed you. your presentation. Thank you. Have a great night. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I know that we have had two really great speakers uh, that we had a lot of questions for. So I have a presentation that I think will take about 15 minutes. Um, and I'm going to cover what the next 18 months looks like in terms of what we're thinking of for implementation. Uh, just bear with me for just a moment as I share my screen. I am like out of practice um, for sharing my PowerPoint. And I have too many windows open. Um, so just so you know, uh, as I am looking for the right file, we, our staff has been talking in depth about how we are going to sort of tackle this new population. And we have no experience really in reaching out to these groups of newly eligible voters. All of our experience is really from, um, you know, reaching out to citizens. So we know we have a lot to learn. Um, and I hope what I am going to go over today is gonna to be informative about how we are thinking of approaching that. Um, okay, I now have my presentation going. Thank you for bearing with me. Um, I am going to just give our 18 month overview of how we're thinking about implementing municipal voting here in New York City. Although now that I've heard Laura describe it as city only voters, I have a feeling we're going to adopt that for how we describe it here in New York City because that's a really easy way to understand it. Um, for anyone who was tuning in late, what is New York City municipal voting? So this is a new law recently passed by city council that, that will allow New York City residents authorized to work in the United States to be eligible to vote in local elections. And just to go over the groups who will be able to vote in local elections starting in 2023, um, this includes lawful permanent residents, it includes holders of temporary work visas, it includes people with refugee status who hold work permits, and also people who are here on status such as DACA. Uh, just some really important dates to know to sort of guide our discussion. Uh, in 2022, the major dates that we are looking at, um, as of March 9th, a new advisory committee needs to be appointed. This will be chaired by the public advocate. Um, we are very happy to say Jamela is, you know, representing the public advocate as the ex officio member here and back. We have talked about collaborating really closely and we look forward to that a lot. Um, this committee will also have two appointees of the mayor's office and two appointees of city council. Um, and we expect to know any day now who those appointees are. Um, we know that the Board of Elections is currently researching how this is done in other jurisdictions and sort of tackling some of the bigger legal questions that are outstanding. They have an implementation report due to City Council and the Mayor on July 1st. So we anticipate having some more information about how they are thinking about implementing this then. Um, then we look all the way ahead to December 9th when New York City municipal voters can officially register to vote. 
And then in 2023, as of January 9th, New York City municipal voters will be able to vote in any municipal election held on or after this date. So the first major election we anticipate this being is in June 2023 when we have a city council primary, um, but this also applies to any special elections held before then. Uh, just to go over the named government agencies that are in this law and sort of the division of responsibilities, uh, many of us on this call know that the Board of Elections is responsible for implementation of really all, uh, all election matters from registration to how poll sites are run to how ballots are counted. So the Board of Elections is responsible for creating new municipal voter registration forms uh, and creating that registration process that goes along with those forms and how they're going to handle those once they receive them. Uh, they do have to maintain a list that includes municipal only voters, and they have to set up a process for municipal only voters at the polls where they will get the correct ballots that only have races for mayor, public advocate, uh, borough president, uh, city council, comptroller, and municipal only um, ballot proposal questions, and no like county, state, or federal races can be on that ballot. The Campaign Finance Board is also named in the law along with the Board of Elections for two main things. Uh, one, we are required to ensure that municipal voter registration forms are available everywhere. You can get a state registration form. I'll talk a little bit more about what that's going to look like in later slides. Uh, we are also responsible for working with community groups to carry out voter education programs. And that's largely what I'm going to focus on today. So just so you know how we're thinking about this, we're thinking about this from a high level in three main phases. Uh, that phase one that's now through the end of June is what we're calling the research and discovery phase. Uh, phase two is really when we start to pivot to doing more field outreach and capacity building both internally and externally. That's going to happen between July and the end of December. Uh, and then starting January 1st, 2023, we start to pivot to our direct to voter outreach to these newly eligible voters. And I'm gonna go into a little more detail about what this looks like. So in the research and discovery phase, uh, our outreach priority during this phase is for highly engaged organizations. We know there have been a lot of organizations that have worked on uh, this new municipal voting law. They worked with city council to get it passed. They have been out front working with groups on the ground. They're highly engaged in this issue. Um, and we wanna make sure that we are going to them for their expertise and collaborating with them as we design uh, these research processes and start to get input for how we can shape our own materials and outreach. Uh, our main goals of this phase, so first off, right now we are in the process of contracting with a research vendor that can start to research some of these populations. Um, because we imagine that, you know, for voters who are here as lawful permanent residents, they might have different questions, concerns, barriers than people who are here on DACA status, for example, or people who are here as refugees. And we want to get a better sense of who are going to be some of the new voters covered into this law. Uh, in this law and how are ways that we can effectively communicate with them. Um, so that is one of our key takeaways, getting those insights on our effective communication strategies. And then as part of this outreach, we need to start to surface questions and needs of community-based organizations so that we can ensure that we're designing the right materials with them in mind. So I won't jump too much into this because it can get very granular, but as I mentioned, we are currently uh, working on contracting with a research vendor. We're preparing and distributing requests for proposals for multilingual translation vendors because we will be expanding the number of languages that I'll also go over in a future slide. Um, we have already been coordinating with key government agencies, as I mentioned, the mayor's office, particularly the mayor's office of immigrant affairs and the civic engagement commission. Uh, the Public Advocates Office and our partners in government. Um, we've also been coordinating with key advocates and organizers and reaching out to the Our City, Our Vote co Coalition that was really responsible for moving this forward and has a lot of expertise in this. Um, and we're also conducting external list building for organizations who want to be kept apprised of what we're doing and what we're releasing when. So we're building that email list and getting folks to sign up every day. Um, and then in the next quarter, uh, April to June, we're going to be really implementing a lot of things that we're setting up for now. 
So we'll be conducting those research and workshops. Uh, we'll be choosing new vendors that are going to help us uh, translate into new languages. We also anticipate needing to do website development to accommodate a lot of the new languages we'll be doing. Uh, and we will also be collecting partner input and feedback as we design that research and giving monthly updates to uh, both the New York City Elections Consortium that we're a founding member of and this listserv that we are building. In phase two for field outreach and capacity building, and as I mentioned, we're talking both externally and internally here. Um, so our outreach priority here is really to start to pivot from those highly engaged organizations to on the ground organizations and service providers. Uh, the people who are going to be the link between us and government and the newly eligible voters that we need to start to build those connections to. Uh, so we really want to focus during this six month phase in providing trainings and educating staff at those organizations that have that direct contact um, and really building their expertise and knowledge of what's in this new law. A lot of what we've been finding is people might be aware that this law has passed, but they're not quite sure what's in it or how it applies to the people they work with. So this period would be all about answering those questions. Um, during this phase, we'll also already be developing concepts for a spring advertising campaign that will encourage these newly eligible voters to register to vote and vote for the first time. Uh, we're also going to be developing new materials and making improvements to our website user experience. Uh, we've been all given us a lot of praise for voting.nyc and what was really important to us now to make sure of is that when voters go to our website, they are served up the right tailored information depending on if they're a city only voter or if they're a voter who's eligible to vote in all elections. We wanna make sure they're getting the right form, the right voter guide information and the right guidance about what elections they can and cannot participate in. Uh, we also are planning to hire an onboard new outreach staff that we would be bringing on board because this law has passed to help us you know, build up some capacity to reach out to these new communities. So you know, this is going to be a really busy time. Again, I'm gonna keep this at a high level, but what we're really focused on July through September is developing a lot of these new materials, such as a new training deck, a new fact sheet for groups on the ground to start to distribute uh, from now through June. Uh, we're going to be developing our campaign message. What is it that we really want to say to encourage people to register to vote? Uh, we'll be sharing out those research findings from the research we're conducting this spring so that highly engaged organizations can have the information we do and that can support them in tailoring their messages and materials as well. Um, then really in the fall, starting in October and running through the end of the year, we're going to be developing our website. We'll be developing a new explainer video, very similar to what we did for Ranked Choice Voting. We'll be finalizing the ad campaign and the entire plan for the spring advertising campaign, uh, and also hosting a lot of town halls and train the trainer series for community organizations and disseminating that fact sheet and materials to organizations as well. And we really anticipate getting that fact sheet out in the fall. Uh, we anticipate that the new registration forms will be available on December 9th. Again, I'm going to talk about language coverage a little bit in a future slide because that's a little complicated right now. Uh, but we are looking at a rolling release of all the languages that we will be covering. Finally, this is the easiest thing to talk about. Uh, phase three is our direct to voter contact phase from January through June 2023. Uh, our outreach priority here are these newly eligible voters who can now register and vote for municipal elections. So this is when we're really gonna pivot from reaching out to organizations to reaching out to individuals. Um, we'll be launching our multilingual campaign to encourage new eligible voters to register to vote. Uh, we'll be focused on uh, conducting in-person visibility and awareness activities at key locations. So we're having a lot of those community-based conversations that we heard Laura talking about that works so well. Um, and we'll also be conducting our large-scale Get Out the Vote outreach, similar to what we've been doing for the past several election cycles. So really January through March is when we focus on having those events, getting out into the community and hosting regular information section, uh, sessions that any individual can sign up for and attend and ask questions. We're looking at having a multilingual campaign in market uh, between February 15th and June 1st when that will be retired to pivot to our traditional get out the vote campaign. 
Uh, and of course, we'll pr be providing updates to everyone along the way and releasing those assets to partners on a rolling basis for when different languages become available. Um, and then that really freezes up from April through June to focus on get out the vote contact and distribution of materials to organizations. So here I just wanna jump into uh, really quickly our translation and accessibility and what we're sort of building in from the outset. Um, so the municipal voter law is not the only exciting city uh, law that passed city council at the end of 2021. Um, there was also a law that um, adds new language and accessibility requirements to the video voter guide. So as background, uh, the Campaign Finance Board has translated our materials into Spanish, Chinese, Korean, and Bengali that have been covered under the Voting Rights Act for many years. Uh, according to the 2020 decennial census, the Department of Justice just released new designations for two more languages to be covered under the Voting Rights Act Section 203. That's Hindi and Punjabi that we anticipate bringing online uh, for our 2023 materials. In addition to that, for that video voter guide law I just mentioned, we have a new mandate to translate our materials into the citywide languages that are not covered under the Voting Rights Act. So these languages are Russian, Haitian Creole, Arabic, Urdu, French, and Polish. Um, that is when I say we're bringing on a multilingual vendor. These are the, all the languages that we are bringing on vendors to translate into. Um, you know, the thing that does get a little bit complicated that I'll tell this committee about is that the Board of Elections currently translates into the Voting Rights Act languages, but not the citywide languages. So for these municipal only forms, if the status quo for translation continues, we do anticipate that we would need to translate forms into the citywide languages, very similar to what we did when we worked with the mayor's office for immigrant affairs in 2016, uh, where, where we worked together and translated the state form into 11 additional languages. We sort of just anticipate needing to absorb this uh, for the municipal forms as well. And finally, um, just so you know how we're making our materials accessible uh, for the fact sheets that we're talking about distributing, this is going to be available in large print in all languages. Uh, for our video explainers, all will have American Sign Language interpretation and closed captions in all languages uh, and audio descriptions of the video content as well. Uh, as I said, we're planning on doing a lot of live events and trainings uh, so we anticipate for those events, providing ASL interpretation and closed captions for all events and making language interpretation available upon request and also having some like targeted language events as well, uh, where we plan up front to do them in Spanish or Bengali or the other languages that we need to service. So that was a lot to cover, I know. Uh, that was my last slide and here I'm happy to take questions. Questions. You can take questions as also remarks as well on the plan. All right. I, guess I, also see, that... I see Terrence's hand is up, but that may be up from before. <laughs> yes, I think his I think its hand is still up from before. Okay. I know that's a lot for everyone to take in. I mean, so like, I think you think about it and then, you know, we're going to, we will make this material available and you have questions or comments um, later on, please, you know, you know that we're always, you know, looking for, uh, you know, suggestions to make things better and improvements of uh, other, you know, things that we can do. Um, you know, you all have access to different communities. And so that, you know, will be important to get your feedback on. Um, I just want to, you know, commend how, you know, this, I mean, this is a major lift for our staff. Um, it will involve, you know, some additional staff resources, but really the small staff that is currently working on it has done really an amazing job getting us set up for that. So I just want to commend our entire public affairs staff for really in, in short order, really, you know, starting a plan that makes a lot of sense to, uh, implement a fairly complicated series of laws. Chris, I see you have your hand up. Yeah, I got lots of questions. Just shows my interest. So the, the, the figures I've seen, Amanda, it's 900,000 
eligible non uh, city voters, if that's the term we're using, is that is that kind of in the ballpark or? Uh, that is roughly in the ballpark. I think the latest numbers from the mayor's office for immigrant affairs was up to 875,000 potential eligible voters. I will say when we've looked into this in different jurisdictions, um, you know, the adoption rate is very dependent, I think, on the city, the sort of dynamics on the ground, um, you know, how, how, like, you know, how proactive I think governments were about outreach. Um, the closest city in size to us, for example, is San Francisco. They only allow people who are not citizens to vote in uh, school board elections, but to do that, you have to be a parent. Um, and we know that they only have maybe a few dozen people who are actually registered to be able to participate in those elections. And that's like the next closest jurisdiction to New York City. So I think that we're in this territory where we're not quite sure um, how many people we can register to vote. We're trying to make some best guesstimates right now um, and just making sure that we are working with all groups on the ground and putting money behind advertising to get the word out as much as possible. And just a quick follow up, um, any sense of which of the five boroughs are, uh, you know, obviously we have more populous bor boroughs, but does that track with the, the population of potential city voters too? Uh, yes, I think the largest communities are going to be concentrated in Queens, followed by Brooklyn. I will say our policy and research team now, and perhaps this is a preview for our next meeting where we're gonna talk about our annual report, um, but our policy and research team is doing a lot of analysis right now to think about like, what are the right neighborhoods and which populations live where? Um, because while there's not really a perfect approximation of, you know, where are the neighborhoods we definitely need to do outreach to, we're looking at neighborhoods with a high proportion of people who are limited English proficient in the different languages um, to, to be our proxy measure of where we need to be focusing. So right now we're just sort of doing another analysis to be like, are we in the right neighborhoods or their neighborhoods we're missing? Uh, and to validate a lot of the things that we've assumed the past few years, now that we're gonna be covering this population we hadn't accounted for yet. Thank you. Not to jump in with some more stats, but because I'm a nerd and love data, I have to. Um, <laughs> but Amanda's right, the, about 30% of the population that would be qualified under the new law live in Queens. 60% live in, sorry, another 30% live in Brooklyn. So those are pretty much the the two boroughs with the largest population, as we know as well. So it does sort of track to that too. Yeah. Any other questions? I see uh, Nora, Nora Moran, I just would like to call out who I believe is from United Neighborhood Houses. Just mentioned like they work with the Our City, Our Vote campaign. They're really excited to get to work and make sure that we're working together to implement this. Um, so really we rely on partners like these to, to help us and make sure that we're uh, being as effective as we possibly can be. So this is, this is just the start. Uh, we're doing a lot of outreach and a lot of great work right now. And uh, we look forward to updating the committee in future meetings. And from there, I'm going to yeah. turn it back to Zoilo. Well, uh, we um, just went around the world a couple of times in almost two hours. Um, and I think that was great. It's a wealth of information. Um, I've learned a lot. Uh, uh, if there are no comments uh, or um, questions or observations, uh, I think we can uh, move on to close the meeting. Um, Hearing none, I guess uh, we can all sign off at this point. Uh, and we're, you know, over an hour and a half uh, of meeting. So it, uh, it worked out very well. Thank you, Amanda. You uh, saved our lives. <laughs> yeah. uh, so we're signing off. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Amanda. Thank, Thank you, you everyone. You did a good Have job. A great we are very pleased. We are very pleased. Thank really. You. you guys are doing hard job. This is yes. really hard job. It's not a easy. Lot, 
but a lot we, of work ahead of us. We, yeah. we already <laughs> achieved our goal. Thank okay. you. Thank Great. you. Thank Sign you. Up. Thank you so much, everyone.